Yeah, yeah, your party is really good at killing monsters, whatever. Have you ever even heard of a negative adventurer imprint before? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, basically it's like how much destruction and gore your party leaves behind in their travels. That primarily pertains to two things, corpses and castle ruins. It's basically the somebody better clean this shit up so I can use this area for the other game I'm running metric. But we're not here to talk about paramathematic concepts that I just made up on the spot. We're here to talk about what you can do with all those corpses of monsters. Mainly, you shouldn't go around touching people corpses. Uh, right. Anyway, welcome to Intermission Episode 3. Let's break down two monsters and go over how to think in terms of utilizing monster parts. It's a very different boat than cooking monster parts, so take off the chef's hat for a moment. Firstly, let's look over something small, like a cockatrice. Breaking this creature down, I see several options. You could remove its pelt and accent your armor with it. It's probably not enough to do a full armor set out of, but you can at least shoot for some bonuses. Leather from its wings could be sewn together to make a cloak. This whole time you'll want to be thinking about benefits of these items beyond cosmetics. Maybe this cloak grants advantage to saving throws against being petrified or something like that. So, armor detailing and a cloak. Not a lot for gear, but from a creature as small and as low leveled as a cockatrice, it makes sense. <laughs> Side note, when dealing with players making items from lower level creatures, be sure to add in things that make the item creation a little more difficult. Higher DCs, longer processes, special hunting procedures, more hunts required, diminishing returns or hunting grounds, etc, etc, etc. Things to dissuade particularly uh, gamey players from just trying to keep making the same thing over and over again to sell off uh, a la Skyrim dagger exploit. But moving on to weapons, I think cockatrice feathers, teeth, and venom could be harvested to create paralytic arrows or something neat like that. You'd be able to make a good bundle of these from one corpse before the no spam rule would need to take effect. And of course, if you're making them in mass, give them a save that's not too difficult to pass. Uh, 11 constitution or 12, maybe 13 if the player crafting them passes a good check. Secondly, a cockatrice beak could be modified and affixed to say a war ax along with their teeth to provide an extra bit of pain. Long story short, the first step to going about breaking down monsters is to visualize what parts can be used in grouping them. So for this cockatrice, we have feathers, a beak, teeth, wing membrane, spines, and pelt. Then you can use innards, venom, and guts for potions and things like that. Check out the old video. Great, now that we've broken down the basics in terms of a small creature, let's talk bigger. Dragons are cool and very big. So let's go over the different areas they can be broken down into. Much the same as the cockatrice, Dragons can have their scales, teeth, claws, wing membrane, and spines harvested. Of course, you're dealing with much larger quantities, so you'll have to get creative if you're making personal items. Cloaks can be made with material to spare. An entire shield might use only two to three scales. Entire swords can be carved from their claws. This is where we start thinking about crafting larger items. Dragon hide tents, for example. Adorned with scales and stitched with heartstring, these tents are made from a dragon's wings and are known for keeping those inside incredibly warm, even in the coldest of climates. Maybe you want to trick out your party carriage with ramming spikes made from the dragon's spines, teeth, and claws? Well, reinforcing the entire thing with dragon bone, that's also an option. The exploit rule still applies here even more so than last time. Make sure you have safeguards in place so your players don't abuse the sheer amount of shit they could hypothetically make with an entire dragon's corpse. Now that the general thought process of pre-visualizing what you can harvest is out of the way, let's go through an example of what this process would look like in its entirety. So, Fran and Anya have just killed King Dalton of the Wormspine Kobolds, and now that- Whoops, wrong book. Sorry about that one. Uh, here we go. Your players have just done away with an iron golem sent to kill them by an angry artificer. Its parts, well separate, are mostly intact, the golem having been torn limb from limb by the infernal druid in Balgara form. Then, all of a sudden, the dragonborn barbarian gets a fantastic idea. The golem's hand roughly matches his own in shape and size, so he gets to work removing it along with its forearm. He is attempting the first steps of crafting his own gear. The DM makes note of this and asks how he'd like to proceed. The dragonborn says he'd like to end up with a gauntlet that can shoot powerful lightning and deliver a strong, shocking enchantment punch. Okay, two enchantments, both powerful, one short range, the other long range. The DM gets to thinking. 
The first step is retrieving more parts. The DM says for two enchantments of that type, the state the arm is currently in isn't enough to cut it. There needs to be some repairs. So step one, repairs. After the arm is restored using more parts scavenged from the construct, docking the available parts to scavenge for future builds, mind you, the DM informs of step two. This step involves securing the proper runic inscriptions to apply to the gauntlet. Two of them are required, one per enchantment. Since they're rather powerful, it may be quite difficult, and after a little bit, the DM presents multiple choices for acquiring these runes. The first is to find the lost library of an ancient mage's guild and pilfer it from its shelf, dealing with the automatons guarding the halls. The second option is to retrieve them from a powerful aristocratic collector in the city. They can either negotiate them out of his grip and buy them off, or pull off a heist and risk a lengthy prison sentence. Both options should only take one session's worth of time. Once the runes are secured, either way, the player must then inscribe them onto the gauntlet. This can be done by doing it themselves or getting someone else to do it. Paying someone is quicker, but costs a pretty penny, whereas DIYing it takes much longer, but is far, far cheaper. Whatever the case ends up being, by the end of this, the Dragonborn Barbarian gets a fancy new shock gauntlet. This process can look different on a case-by-case -case basis. It can be made of fewer, more complicated steps, or a lot more simple steps. Maybe crafting something won't even require the craftsman to leave the spot where they killed the monster they're using. Could be that simple. Whatever ends up happening, the one big takeaway is that your players could ask to craft any number of things, and you'll always want to be flexible and imaginative with these sort of things. A good handle on balancing doesn't hurt either. Always ask yourself, does the power the player is asking for match what I'm making them do for it? That all out of the way, that wraps up this episode of Monsters Misguided Intermission. Thank you all for watching, and a big thanks to my patrons for supporting this channel and my art. An even bigger thank you to all my golden eggs and geese, pledgy big boys. Can't believe people are as eager for the higher tiers as they were. If you haven't pledged already, go take a look. You might see something you find worth paying for. That's all for me. Bye-bye.